I, I don't have that offhand, but we certainly can keep that. That is a metric that we keep and we uh, report on it regularly. Mm -hmm. um, we do, um, we're happy to report actually with, um, in 2014, which is the last year of full, full reporting on this, that in regard to impaired driving, our fatalities were at the lowest ever that had alcohol as a factor, um, which we were very pleased with. And as a result of many of the um, initiatives of the governor, um, has directed not only us to take, but also legislation that has been passed. Um, we were really happy to see that, that those numbers start to come down. Are we tracking the number of uh, accidents due to distracted driving, from, particularly from texting? Uh, yes, we have an ability. Um, the, the Governor's Traffic Safety Committee website actually has these reports um, mm -hmm. that are done, they're available on their website. Um, it's, a, it's a little difficult to track because, again, we don't say anything is um, a particular cause. Mm -hmm. um, the way that police and law enforcement report, it's a factor. Um, but certainly, if, if you go to the charts that are there, you can look at factors from cell phone to texting to distracted driving, and I think there's even one for eating while driving. Mm -hmm. um, so those numbers are all set out. Thank you. And another issue that uh, has been of a concern to myself, Assembly McCusick and I have been carrying a bill uh, for several years now with respect to uh, creating a crime of intruding into the work zone. The number of work zone fatalities across the state continues to go up despite us increasing fines. Everyone, when you drive down the thruway, you see a sign that says, you know, uh, the penalties are doubled for, you know, speeding through the work zone. But it has had very little impact on changing people's behavior. So we have been pushing the idea of creating a felony, creating the crime of vehicular uh, homicide for intentional intruding into the work zone. Uh, the Senate has passed this bill several times, but we're kind of running into um, uh, problems convincing others that this is necessary because they don't see the number of summonses. So I'm not sure if you know the answer to that question or if you could point me to in a direction where I can obtain the information to justify our position that we need to increase these penalties because intrusions into the work zone are creating not just a hazard for the workers on the work zone, but actually it creates a bigger problem for drivers. Sure. I mean, we certainly can, can work with DOT as well as our Governor's Traffic Safety Committee and some of our other data mm -hmm. people um, to provide whatever data you think you need. Yeah, but those tickets are adjudicated by your ALJs, aren't they? It, it depends on where, it depends on where, where the um, infraction happens. Mm -hmm. Some could be our ALJs, some could be local town right. um, judges and magistrates. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Senator. Next, I would call on Senator Kathy Marchione. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Good Hi, see, how are good you? Good to see you, thank, Senator. Thank, thank, how are you? It's good. Nice to see you, too. Uh, recently, it has come to my attention that uh, State DMV has put out for bid uh, the ability of a private, private company to process commercial or dealer work as known by county clerks. Can you uh, tell me whether that is true or not? I, I do not believe that's true. Okay, I had, a, I had a gentleman in my office who actually, the company is in my district, told me that he put a bid in for uh, work with the Department of Motor Vehicles. So you're confirming that um, at this time you have not put I, work out. I am not aware of what that would be. We certainly could, if you would like after this, get us the information and we can track it down and more specifically discuss it, but I'm not aware of any bid that's going out for dealer work. Okay, that was my second question. Um, I know that you've done a, a great deal of work for online and it's very easy to use. Um, county clerks hate it, of course, as you know, but certainly it's a, a terrific for people to be able to get their DMV work done quickly. Um, have you uh, secured a, an online program for dealers as, as of this time? So that dealers, I know that they have been able to for years but have not. Have you streamlined and looked at programs where dealers are now going to start going online? Well, again, the partnering program um, has been available at DM Free for several years. Um, as far as any new initiative in regard to that, the answer would be no. Um, the only thing, and again, trying, trying to figure out exactly what your constituent may be referring to, um, we are um, getting ready to put out an RFP for um, an online um, EMV system, it's basically called, it's to al allow um, the transfer and the inventory of um, new cars, used cars for dealers to be done electronically as opposed to on paper. Um, but that has to do with really more, again, just the inventory and the transfer 
um, that RFP we would expect to go out hopefully next month. Okay, and that might be what he was talking it, about. It, it, he wasn't explaining it, it well. It could be, but we'd be happy to follow up with you if you would like. Thank, thank you. One other question. Um, you have a, a program, it's Compass. Yes. But within Compass, there, there's a feature called Tickets in Compass. Yes. I've had, uh, my local district attorney has had been in contact with me because in her office they're able to access that. The problem that they're experiencing is they would love to see that program expanded to local justice courts. In any given day, in just one of my counties in Saratoga, they process 200, about 200 cases a day. They can't possibly look at everything when it's in a local justice court. They don't have time. But the local justice court, even with limited access, a certain individual, someone within there to be able to look at tickets and compass. Let me tell you the situation that occurred, that we actually went to DMV and asked if we could hook on to ticket, tickets in Compass. We had an accident in my district with uh, four, four young high school students, and the young man who was responsible for the accident had 22 violations stockpiled that no one knew about because they weren't able to access what he hadn't taken care of. And so at that point, we went to DMV, and we asked if we could hook in. And you were running a pilot, and thank you. You put Saratoga on that pilot. Well, now they know it works so well. And local courts have access, of course, to all criminal records through DCJS. They really need to have access to Compass in order for them, not only in a plea agreement, but in any decision that the judge is rendering, to know what is out there and what may still be outstanding in order to be able to know what they really need to do with that person in front of them. So my, I'm here today hoping that access can be given uh, to our local justice courts. Yes, Senator, we're aware of that. And, and again, for, for those that may not be familiar with this, um, it, it, here in New York, um, local courts as well as DAs can receive an abstract, which is what we talk about as a driver's driving record. And it lists out convictions. There is a program um, that we started a, a couple of years ago called Tickets and Compass, which allows certain people to have access not only to the driver conviction, but to what the original charges were. Um, there was a decision at the time that the program was instituted that that access would be given to district attorneys um, so that they can make the determination whether or not they would even want to make an offer for a plea bargain for a particular matter. There was a decision also at that time that um, town judges and courts would not have that same access, um, mostly because, again, judges, as an objective, neutral arbiter, um, the idea would be seeing the original charge prior to the time that they may be called upon to actually have a trial to make a determination of guilt or innocence. We would not want anybody to be unfairly biased, and we would certainly want the motorist to, to, to feel that there was fairness going on at, at all levels, with the DA, as well as their defense attorney, as well as the town judge. Um, so that, that, is, that is really the, the theory behind doing it this way, and town judges can absolutely get access to this at the appropriate time through their district attorney. So I'm familiar with the case on the Northway, um, and, and I would just say that while the town judge may not have had access to this document and this information, the district attorney um, certainly did, and if it was any time within the last three years or so, um, they would have had, had any sort of information in regard to the, pro to the priors on this. Um, so I understand the concern, and, and we understand the request um, but at this time, again, balancing what we believe to be the fairness to the motorist um, as well as the objectivity and the unbiased nature of the judicial system, um, th that's our policy as, as we sit here. I, my, my request is just to hope that you revisit that policy. But thank you for your explanation. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Malia Takas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to follow up on some of the drunk driving stuff. One of the first bills that I had uh, introduced when I came to the legislature was to strip um, licenses from individuals uh, after third conviction. It was like sort of like a three-strike, sure out. 
Um, a similar law, uh, Vince's law, went into effect, uh, I think 2014. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could provide a little bit of an update on how that's been working. Um, at the time that this law went into effect, there were about 47,000 individuals, I think, in the database that had repeated, uh, not repeated, but three times convictions, three, three convictions of drunk driving. And I wanted to know what your perspective is on how this law is working and if it goes really far enough. Um, certainly, I, it may be a little premature to make a determination on how well it's working. Um, I do believe, I think we just read about a month and a half ago that we had our first um, either arrest and or conviction under, under the new law. Um, and, it, and it takes a little bit of time to really compile all of that information. And even though somebody may be getting charged with that new law, as a judicial system works, it may take several months, if not in excess of a year, before it works its way through the judicial system. So it's something that we will continue to work on. Um, and as you know, too, we, we try um, to, the, to the, you know, the best of our authority is take a very strong look at not only these impaired drivers, and again, we're looking not only at al alcohol now, but we're also looking at drug impaired um, and seeing what we can do within our own authority. And certainly as proposals come from the legislature, we review those also. The, the first case of uh, the conviction that you mentioned, was that a license that was suspended um, or was it a, just a, someone who you know, was sentenced to seven years, which was the maximum? I, I think it had to do with the arrest and not the sentence. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll see, hopefully we'll see some progress with this in getting people off the streets. Um, I have another question regarding uh, the state identification cards. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the process for an individual um, who is either, it's only, uh, state identification cards are only given to um, citizens or legal residents, correct? Well, it, citizenship is not an element of our license issuance process. Um, it, so I'm not sure if you're talking about just our regular license or if you're talking about what potentially would be a real ID document. Um, state ID document. Okay. Citizenship is not an element of our um, licensing process. Um, and again, online, we have a very, I think, robust website in regard to what would be needed um, for someone to come into an office to receive either a non-driver ID and or their license. But, but to receive an ID, you do need to be a legal resident of, of the city and the, and the nation, no? A again, in regard to a non-driver ID, um, not being a real ID document, citizenship is not an element of our license process. Citizenship is not, but what about a legal resident? It is not either. So you can be an illegal immigrant. I, you could be an illegal immigrant and obtain a New York State identification card. Re residency versus citizenship; those are two different things, Assemblywoman. So I'm. Not, but you're I'm, either a legal resident or you're not. You're either you are either a citizen. So if you are not a citizen of the United States and you're not a legal resident of the United States, so you are here illegally, you can still obtain a state identification card. Well, again, we would have to look at the documentation that was provided. We are provided with all sorts of different um, types of passports, citizenship documents, um, temporary residence, um, and on each one of those things, there's a different process. Again, but, but if you are here without any of those documents, making you, illegal, not making, making you not a legal resident, can you obtain an identification card? I think that's a pretty you know, pretty black and white question, either if you are not legally here, whether it be with a, a visa or um, any I, I would other say if you, not, if you cannot provide us with the documentation to show that you are, are legally here and meet the, the, the checklist that we have in regard to the documents that we need, we could not provide an identification card. Okay, so unlike the city of New York, um, if, you are, if you are here illegally, you do not have legal status to be in the United States. You oh. cannot obtain a card. I just yeah, I, I no. can't comment on what New York City does. We're not sure what it is that they Okay, do. but in the state of New York, the state does not give a identification card if you're not a legal resident. Just a yes or a no. I, I believe the answer is no, we don't. Okay. Although citizenship is not an element, again, of our licensing process. It depends on the paperwork that's provided to us as well as the passport information. But you need to show some documentation that you're here Legally. There is a series of things that we would look okay. at. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator DeLon would like to ask one more question. Yes. Or maybe more than one. <laughs> no, just one and very quickly again. Um, I, I wanted to understand or what enforcement is going on with um, unlicensed 
uh, used car dealers and in terms of uh, uh, curb stoning, where they're just parking their vehicles uninsured, not registered, and I want to know what enforcement uh, your agency is taking upon these unlicensed used car dealers. And I know that New York City Police Department is at a loss as to what they do with these vehicles that are uh, in, in residential areas. Sure. As, as senators, we receive those complaints. We will send out our um, automobile facility investigators, our AFIs, um, to look to see if we can find evidence of, of an unlawful dealership. Um, oftentimes, I will say that it, it is not something where we can find evidence of a dealership, and then it does become a law enforcement issue, um, and we work with NYPD as best we can on that. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. They're really, really important to me. Thank you. Did, did you say anything about building a wall? <laughs> and getting Trump and getting the money to pay for it? Because it seemed like that's the way you were going. You were kind of headed. Thank you. Thank you. New York State Thruway Authority, Canal Corporation, Maria Lehman, Interim Executive Director, Matt Howard, CFO, Gordon Coffey, Council. Chairperson Young, Chairperson Farrell, and members of the Senate and Assembly Fiscal and Transportation Committees, thank you for having me here today. I am Maria Lehman, the Interim Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer for the New York State Thruway Corp Authority and Canal Corporation. This is a very important year for the Thruway Authority. The Executive Budget proposes a capital appropriation of $700 million in the Thruway Stabilization Program. This is in addition to the nearly $1.3 billion approved in 2015. We are grateful to the Governor for this infusion of capital from the settlements with banks and financial institutions. These funds will allow us to continue the progress we've made on the new New York Bridge, as well as meet our system-wide capital needs, while enabling tolls to remain frozen at current levels until 2020. The executive budget also includes a tax credit that will cut tolls for frequent users of the thruway and eliminate tolls for agricultural users, benefiting nearly one million passenger, business, and farm vehicles. 
drivers of passenger vehicles who spend at least $50 annually, and business and, a com and commercial account holders who spend between $100 and $9,999 annually, and in throughway tolls, would receive a tax credit worth 50% of the tolls paid. <coughs> Further, farming vehicles bringing farm goods to market would have tolls eliminated completely through a 100% tax credit. Finally, the executive budget proposes the transfer of the Canal Corporation to the New York State Power Authority in recognition of the natural nexus of missions between canals and the Power Authority. The 27 hydroelectric generating facilities along the canal system represent 9% of the state's total hydroelectric facilities and approximately 2.3% of its annual hydroelectric power production. The Power Authority currently manages the corporation's largest reservoir, the Hinkley Reservoir, and the corporation routinely performs maintenance work for the Power Authority at the Crescent and Fisher Ferry Dams, where the Power Authority operates hydroelectric power generation facilities. This transfer allows the Thruway Authority to reassume roughly $85 million in operating costs that have been supported by the state since 2013. These costs include approximately $26 million in state support and approximately $59 million for the New York State Police Troop T costs that were assumed by the state, which will now be returning to the Thruway Authority. The Three Authority adopted a 2016 budget that is balanced and provides the necessary resources to maintain the current levels of maintenance, safety, and service on our system. The Thruway Authority's capital and operating costs are being effectively and efficiently managed, and our 2015 revenue has exceeded expectations. Another noteworthy point is that the Thruway Authority has held annual operating growth to less than 1% since 2011, and we project that we can continue that trend into the near future. There is significant progress on the construction of the new New York Bridge thanks to the dedicated professionals working on the project. The single largest bridge and highway infrastructure project in North America, this new crossing is literally rising from the water and stretching further across the Hudson every day. In the past months, the first steel girders have reached the Rockland Landing and additional progress includes 55% of the concrete piers are complete, 46% of the steel girders are fabricated, and 34% of the deck panels are fabricated. The governor's 2016-2017 proposed budget recognizes the Thruway's vital role as the backbone for commerce, tourism, and commuters in New York. It is important to reiterate that the funds included in the executive proposal are for capital improvements, not operating costs. The $700 million in assistance will ensure that all of the necessary capital maintenance and improvements we have planned can occur without requiring a toll adjustment. One final note, we could not do anything of what we do without our dedicated employees across the state, and I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge their hard work, dedication, and ongoing commitment to the highest standards of safety and reliability in every area of our operations. Thank you for your time. I would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walter, Assemblyman Walter. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Lehman, congratulations. I hope we can make you the permanent uh, position, not just temporary here. But um, it's nice to have someone with some uh, Western New York uh, experience at the Thruway Authority. I'd like to talk specifically about something uh, in my district, which is the Williamsville Toll Barrier. Um, in, in previous years, we've approached the Thruway Authority about eliminating the tolls between exit 49 and 50 for uh, our commuters who use that um, passage frequently. Uh, with this proposal by the governor, uh, is that something that is more achievable today than it was previously, or uh, is that something uh, that's not on the table at all, or can we talk about it further? Um, our current five-year capital plan does include some improvements at Williamsville. 
Um, as far as, as changing out the barriers, that isn't, is not in our current capital plan. Um, but what we have done as part of the Cleveland Hill uh, Road and, and Bridge Project, we have made improvements there to be able to allow better throughput. Um, we had added uh, 20 mile per hour easy pass lanes, for example, by reconfiguring in the plaza, and we'll be adding some lanes um, this construction season. So it's, it's a little more effective and efficient as far as a toll plaza. Um, we will be looking towards the future of a plan to be able to do more, um, but in our current five-year plan, it's not included. So the, uh, specifically, you know, one of the issues we're looking at is having high-speed uh, lanes there. Um, that is not, uh, is that in, in any sort of plans within the next five years? Um, what we are doing right now is, is doing the high-speed all-electronic tolling um, at the Tappan Zee at the New New York Bridge. Um, and we're hoping that we can use the lessons learned there. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, changes that have to happen at Williamsville because of the, the vertical and horizontal curves. And so there's a lot of, it's capital intensive to change that barrier. Um, so we want to be able to make sure we, we kind of understand all electronic tolls and then start working on a plan for the throughway. And even with the improvements there, there still is, continues to be, you know, failures at the toll at, at high volume, you know, peak times. Um, you know, with traffic backing up all the way to Cayuga Road and beyond in many instances. Um, you know, obviously high-speed tolls will, uh, you know, alleviate some of that, but um, back to my original question, you know, the governor has proposed this tax credit to reduce the cost of um, anybody who spends more than $50 a year uh, on the throughway. Uh, I think it's a 50% tax credit that he's proposed. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way that we can get use use that as a way to eliminate that 15 cent toll between exit 49 and 50? I mean, I think it's something we're going to have to look at with the financial plan and how things shake out. Um, we're hopeful that we're going to see. Right now, we see about 70% Easy Pass usage across the system. Um, in Williamsville, it's about 70 percent, or it's 80 percent at the new New York Bridge um, site. So if we get more easy pass, then we're more efficient, and so we can, you know, use the information we glean from when we uh, have a tax credit um, to make better decisions for strategies for the future. Access to the easy pass lane there, though, is very difficult. When you're all the way on the left, you, narrow, you go from, you don't get to three lanes or four lanes or whatever, however many it is, nine or ten lanes. Um, until uh, after the bottleneck occurs. So that I mean, there needs to be some sort of a, a long-term plan, I think. Um, you know, obviously r removing the Williamsville toll barrier has been an issue for going on 20 years now um, and was certainly part of the a plan long ago that, um, you know, shouldn't be abandoned. I mean, we need to uh, get back to and I, you know, I'll start putting plans together to finally eliminate that toll barrier. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not conducive for the economic comeback that's happening in Western New York right now. It's, it's hurting us. Um, so anything we can do to keep that on the, on the priority list would be, would be good. And I would encourage you to advocate for that in your new role here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, um, there was a lot of talk for a long time and we are making incremental. Um, improvements um, in the interim so that we're not just waiting until we have the whole answer. So hopefully some of the interim improvements will help um, and we certainly will look at a long term strategy. Yeah, and, and, I mean, obviously you know the issue is a lot of that traffic gets diverted right down the middle of the village of Williamsville. 40,000 cars a day right down Route 5 right in the middle of the village. Uh, anything we can do to help alleviate some of that congestion would be good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. So, great to see you again, Executive Director Lehman. And uh, I thank you for being here. And I do have a few questions regarding the executive budget proposal. So, as you pointed out, there's $700 million in financial settlement monies to help fund the um, Tappan Zee Bridge and the Authority's Capital Program, building on the $1.3 billion approximately included in the 2016 enacted budget. 
So according to the governor, this additional support would bring the authority's two-year total of settlement funds to $2 billion and enable the thruway authority to avoid a toll increase until at least 2020. The executive budget for this year also includes legislation for a three-year thruway toll reduction and protection plan of $340 million that would issue tax credits to residents and small businesses, reducing their tolls by 50 percent, as well as a full toll reduction for farmers, which is welcome news for rural areas across New York. Um, I was wondering, can the thruway confirm that the cost of the new Tappan Zee Bridge will not lead to a system-wide toll increase? Because we have this plan for the next four years to have basically a freeze, but what happens after then? And there are a lot of questions about how we're going to continue to pay for the construction of the Tappan Zee Bridge, and people across the state are concerned about where that funding is coming from and whether it would be put as a burden on the entire system. 